Okay, so the last speaker of the session is Martin Ingram. Uh, Martin is a machine learning engineer at Silver Pond in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> he has been doing data science and tennis modeling since 2014, when he wrote his master's thesis on tennis prediction at Imperial College in London. At Silver Pond, Martin is developing deep neural networks for computer vision and spends his free time building Bayesian predictive modelings, don't we all? <laughs> so take it away, Martin. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to talk about this point-based Bayesian hierarchical model to predict the outcome of tennis matches. And so I'd, I thought I'd start off with a bit of motivation. So why is it interesting to predict tennis matches in the first place? Um, I think um, we had some great talks about that in the morning. So Mike and Ben made some, made some great points that, um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a coach, you might want to track players over time and see whether they're getting better or worse. Are the ideas you're testing out working or are they not working? And so prediction models can kind of help you track that. Um, and also maybe if you have a tough loss, um, you, you can estimate just how bad that loss was by looking at expectations. So maybe um, that player you lost to was actually just incredibly good at that point, so you don't have to worry about it too much. And uh, the other point I came up with is kind of fan engagement. That's more the reason I build these models, sort of just like working out who's the best player um, in a given moment, uh, who's improving, and so on. So um, just a bit of motivation there. So in tennis in particular, um, the literature basically has three different types of models. So there are regression models, paired comparison models, and um, point-based models. And I'll talk a little bit about those. So regression models are kind of what you'd expect. Um, you have, uh, you, have a, um, you phrase the match prediction problem as a regression task. You use some kind of link function to predict the match outcome. Usually that's the pro bit in tennis, um, although you could use the loaded as well or whatever you like. Um, and so one example is Gil Stoffedal, who used a pro bit model, which includes ranking, prize earnings, and demographics. Uh, the other group are pet comparison models. So we had some talks about those earlier today already. Um, so what you do there is that you assume that there's some kind of hidden latent ability for each player. And then um, the uh, probability of a player winning a match is some function of usually the difference of those two latent abilities. So um, ELO, for example, assumes this likelihood here, which is kind of a logistic term. And um, uh, actually, in, in tennis, uh, 538 came up with an ELO, which is particularly popular. And what they do is they have this, they have kind of an optimized K factor. So K uh, just determines how much um, you update your skill um, estimates from each particular match. So that one's pretty popular. But there are other interesting pad comparison models. So there's TrueSkill and, and Glico. Um, they're not quite as popular for tennis, but they're still very interesting. Yeah, and with that, to, uh, I come to point-based models. So this is the class of models I'm going to talk about. And they're kind of unique to tennis, because uh, they build on this thing called the IID model of tennis, which was developed by, among others, by Newton and Keller. So what that assumes is that points on serve in a tennis match are independent and identically distributed. So what does that mean? Basically, it means that the probability that you win a point on serve stays constant throughout the entire match. So whether you're serving the first point of the match or the last point in the match, doesn't matter. That probability is assumed to be constant. So maybe you can tell already that that seems a little suspect, but, uh, but we'll see that it's actually a pretty good approximation. And um, if you do make that assumption, the nice thing is that you um, can actually calculate a lot of things. So you can calculate um, analytically the probability of winning a set, a tie break, a uh, holding serve, and so on, just with these two quantities. So uh, here's an example of that. Here's the probability of holding serve as um, a function of the probability of winning a point on serve. And you see it has this kind of sigmoid shape. Um, and actually on the ATP, the average um, serve winning probability is about 63%. So actually the, the probability of holding serve is about 80%. And that's why you don't see a lot of breaks in men's tennis. And actually also why you see more breaks on women's tennis because they'd be more around here. So you can see that they'd be lower on this curve. So it's just to do with the dominance of serve in, in both um, uh, tours. So then uh, you can also look at the probability of winning a match. And then you get this kind of contour plot, because now it's a function of two variables. And uh, basically, what you can see is these uh, contours are pretty closely bunched together. So once you move to the match level, 
small differences are magnified quite a lot, and even just a 5% gap becomes pretty significant. So how do you use point-based models for tennis prediction? Well, um, it's uh, pretty straightforward, really. So you, the, the task just becomes to estimate these probabilities P1 and P2. And one of the classic models, which does pretty well, is Barnett and Clark. So what they do is um, they, uh, they calculate the term winning probability like this. So they have this um, tournament offset term. So they allow for the fact that some tournaments, it's easier to win a point on serve than others. So that's this baseline here. Then we have this term, which is just how much the uh, average probability of the current server differs from the tour average. So if you're a good server, that'll be higher. And a second term, which is the same for the returner, so how much better the returner is than the average on tour. So yeah, how do these models compare? So um, Stephanie gave a talk earlier today, published, I think, a really interesting paper on this in 2015, um, which compared 11 different models which kind of fall into these classes. And uh, that paper is really interesting because uh, Actually, um, before that, it was a little bit hard to compare these models because everyone kind of did the evaluation on their own subset of data, so one would use a different season from everyone else. And so it's a bit hard to tell like, which one actually performs well. But um, here, they're all benchmarked against a whole season of matches, which is about 2,000 matches. And it looks like here, so the regression-based models um, do fairly well. ELO does best, but this point-based model actually does worse than all of them. Um, so that's not, not great. Um, so there are basically some pros and cons with this point-based approach. Um, it isn't the only problem with the ID model. Um, actually, the ID model is, is known to be just an approximation, as I mentioned before. Um, players do not actually play to IID, um, although deviations are quite small. So players almost play to IID, which is actually quite an interesting result in itself. So uh, why would you use this IED model? Why would you use these point-based models, um, even if they are less accurate? Um, shouldn't you just use ELO or maybe a, um, a regression-based model? Um, so the nice thing about these point-based models, and the, really the thing I, I like about them a lot, is that you can calculate a lot of probabilities with them. So you're not limited to just the match prediction. Um, as we've already seen, you can calculate the probability of holding serve, but you can also calculate the number of expected sets. You can calculate which set scores are likely, and uh, there's lots more. So there's a great paper by Barnett um, who derives all kinds of probability distributions over games, even numbers of points. So you can put a probability on a match having 100 points, for example. Um, and another nice thing is you can calculate in-play win probabilities as well um, for every point in a match. So that's pretty nice. And here's just an example of that. So um, here's for 60% and 50%. You can see that's how likely different scores would be. Um, and you see at, at this quite low, at these quite low percentages, 6.3, 6.2, and 6.4 would be pretty likely. Whereas if you have two really strong servers, um, actually the tie break becomes very likely. And that's kind of what you know as a tennis fan anyway. But it's kind of interesting that you can put a number on it. Um, so yeah, so what I wanted to do is basically build a better point-based model. So can we improve on this? Um, on these models, or are they just doomed to be worse because of maybe this IID assumption? So what I really wanted to inclu include in this model um, are surface preferences. So it's quite well known in tennis that um, some players do better on some surfaces than others. So I point out Nadal here. Um, he has uh, 10 French Open titles, which is on clay, but only, only two at Wimbledon, which is on grass. Um, so he's clearly even though he's an excellent player all around, he's particularly good on clay. And that's the case for a lot of players, that they're better on one surface than another. Um, then there are also these tournament effects. So that's the term Barnett and Clark had in there as well. So at some tournaments, it's just easier to win points on serve than others. So there's like a, an average that goes up and down for different players. And also there's a time dependence. Player skills do change over time, and I, I wanted to model that as well. So um, first, first of all, what's kind of the link function? So the, the way I, I formulate this is um, just as a binomial. So I split each match into two. And uh, for each player, they are going to serve n times, and they're going to win y of those points. So the link is just this binomial with this probability of winning the point on serve. That's kind of the all-important thing we're trying to estimate. So uh, this is the most complicated slide. Uh, 
it's not as bad as it looks. I know everyone says that, but this one isn't too bad. Um, so uh, there's, there's just alpha and beta. So alpha is the serve strength, beta is the return strength. Um, so these are kind of the terms Barnett and Clark had as well. Then we have gammas. Gammas are the, um, are the surface preferences. So the servers, um, surface preference minus the returners for the particular surface. And then we have the tournament specific intercepts here. So um, they just reflect that it might be easier or harder to win a point at particular tournaments. And um, as you can see, the, the, they have these period indices now as well. So um, the serve and return skills are time dependent. Um, so how do, how do we model this time dependence? So I basically took some cues from Glico here. Um, so what Glico does is that um, you assume that the next, the skills in the next period are, are some random um, perturbation from the previous period. So it's this kind of random walk. Um, and um, we estimate also this, uh, this, the variance of this random walk. Um, so the idea is that you know, if, if, you, if, you don't, um, uh, if you don't know anything else, that the skills in the next period are probably quite close to the skills in the previous period, but they might, players might have improved somewhat or got somewhat worse. And um, the other thing I, I wanted to put in the model are just hierarchical priors. So we have a lot of these, um, in fact, so there are about 400 players in the data set, and there's uh, about, um, I think, about 80 tournaments. So you kind of benefit from a hierarchical structure. Um, actually, I, I first fit this model without uh, some hierarchical priors, uh, just as sort of a test. And it was quite interesting because uh, I think Jose Statham came up as the best server on the tour. And uh, Jose Statham played one match. And it is, it's, uh, he, I think he even lost, which was even worse. But he just basically did pretty well in that one match. And so if you don't have like a hierarchical prior, you get these kinds of weird results. Uh, so how does this model perform? Um, so I, I used kind of this, this uh, paper to compare um, the model. And I, I fit from 2011 onwards to predict 2014. So um, I, fit, I, I took periods to be three months long and then fit every quarter and predicted each quarter. And it turns out that this model actually performs quite a lot better than Barnard and Clark. So we now have 68% accuracy and a log loss of 0.6. So it's not quite as good as ELO, but it's definitely a lot better than um, the previous point-based model. And um, yeah, I, I think that's quite a strong result because um, uh, you know, these point-based models are so much more expressive. So you can calculate a lot more things. Um, and also, if we look at the, the point level validation, so this is how well it predicts the serve winning probabilities, um, the proposed model also beats uh, Barnard and Clark by a fair margin on RMSC and the R squared. Uh, because this is a Bayesian model, um, we can also do some posterior predictive checks. So um, we can look at the repl replications. So um, basically, we can just um, resample the data several times under the model and generate new outcomes, hypothetical outcomes and then compare some test statistics on our data to those in the replications. So you see that the model is able to capture the mean quite nicely. So the data basically falls like right within this histogram of possible means you calculate on the replications. Uh, the standard deviation doesn't look so good, though. So actually, the model is unable to um, get the same variance as we see in the real data. Um, I mean, the difference isn't huge, but it's, it's still there that there's something going on there. And if we look in a bit more detail, um, just at one replication, you can see that kind of at the edges, um, the, uh, so for high expected um, points one on serve, we kind of under predict, and uh, for low, we um, over predict. Um, so the effect isn't very big, but it's still kind of interesting, and I think maybe there's some, this has something to do with these non IID effects, but um, still something to investigate. Overall, though, the model works pretty well, so we can use it to analyze some things. Um, so here's some, here's some uh, plots of some of the estimates. Um, so here are the, so you know, one of the things this model allows us to do is kind of not just see overall skills of players as ELO would do, for example, but also how well players do on serve and on return. And on serve here, Isn and Karlovich do, do best, most likely, which I think makes sense to most tennis fans because Isn and Karlovich are very tall um, and so they serve very well. Um, and um, so Isna Karlovich do very well. Um, Kyrgios, Reynic are also you know, kind of what, you, what you'd expect. Anderson as well, they're all quite tall players and very good servers. Maybe a bit surprising is to see Federer right up there. 
So even though he's one of, he's considerably shorter than Karlovich and Isner, he still does very, very well on serve. So he's ex an exceptionally good server. Um, and um, the other surprise, I think, is to see Nadal there. So Nadal is actually not considered to be a particularly great server, but probably because he rallies so well, he's able to compensate quite a lot. On the return, this all kind of makes sense. Nadal, Murray, Djokovic, all very famous players. Schwartzman, maybe it's a bit of a surprise. Um, he's kind of the converse to Isnan Karlovic. He's actually quite short, um, and he's, he's compensated. Um, he's it's just very good at rallying, but his serve is, is pretty bad, so that's why you might not have heard of him. Um, and then we can put the serve and return skills together to get kind of overall skill estimates. And here, so this is all um, very recent, so uh, I, um, I fit this just up to the US Open. You can see that Nadal and Federer here tower over everyone else right now, which kind of makes sense because they've shared all four Grand Slams this season, so um, that's kind of what you'd expect. But there's some, um, some slight surprises here maybe. So um, Kyrgios does very well. Uh, Kyrgios is a player from Australia, and he's, he's quite young and sort of a bit moody, um, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but <laughs> But um, he actually does very well in this model, and uh, he's only ranked um, number 18 in the ATP rankings. Um, so that's, that's quite interesting, because the ATP rankings, they really judge you only on how well you do in tournaments. Uh, so they're cumulative. So if you, if you have a lot of good results, that shows up in your ATP ranking, whereas this model is not so sensitive to that. Um, so, um, and I think, yeah, it's, tennis fans would probably agree that he can perform very well, and he, he beat Nadal recently, which not many people have done, so um, maybe it's not that surprising. Uh, another thing you can do is this kind of taxonomy of tennis players, so you can look at the serve and return skills plotted against each other, uh, and here you see some interesting patterns, so um, Isner is right all the way over here, so again, he's, he's very tall, um, and he has this ex uh, excellent serve, so he's very, very good at serve, but he's also terrible at returning. Um, and Schwartzman, on the other hand, is excellent at returning, but very bad at serving. So another thing to say here is maybe that these are the top 40 players, so they're all good in their own way. So they have to find kind of a balance uh, between these two things. And you see there's this spectrum of people here who fall somewhere in the middle. But then there's this cloud of, I guess, this sort of champions era, um, area up here, which is quite interesting. So these are players that are good at serving and returning. So Nadal, Federer, um, Djokovic and Murray have shared a lot of the Grand Slams in the previous years. Um, and interestingly, Cilic and Zverev are up there as well now, so that's maybe quite interesting for the coming years, maybe they're contenders. Um, here's another sort of interesting thing you can do. Um, uh, this year, so Federer won two Grand Slams, Nadal won two Grand Slams. That was after long droughts, so a lot of people had actually caught, um, had thought they maybe wouldn't win anything anymore. Um, and so, you know, the press is all about Federer's backhand has improved massively. And, um, uh, but actually, if we look at these skill estimates over time, um, and uh, particularly the overall skill, you see that Federer actually peaked, according to the model, in 2015. So he's actually a little bit worse this year than he was back then. So why has he won things? Well, you also see that Novak Djokovic was incredibly good in 2015, but has been on a decline since um, about the start of 2016, um, and, uh, and so that kind of explains how Federer um, has been doing so well. He's just been able to maintain his high level and not drop anywhere near as much as Djokovic. Nadal, though, um, so this is kind of interesting because usually, I mean, people all, it's quite obvious that he's improved a lot this year, but you can see that uh, there are particularly great gains on the serve, so particularly here from um, from the last quarter of 2016 to 2017, he's had this huge jump on serve skill, and it's actually the biggest single jump in the entire fit, so from 2014 onwards. So there's really something going on here, probably. And um, one explanation might be that Nadal um, hired Moya recently as a new coach, and um, there's some suggestion that he's become a lot more variable on serve, so it looks like it's really probably paying off for Nadal. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I thought I'd show you kind of what match prediction looks like with this model. Here's what we can do for the, for the US Open. So this is the N nadal Anderson matchup. Um, so Nadal, these are the, the posterior predictions for the serve probabilities, and um, Nadal was expected to do better than Anderson. Uh, he was expected to win, 
and um, the set scores conveniently um, were predicted, right? So it doesn't always work this well. Um, but here, you know, the, the predictions match up quite nicely. But um, the other thing I wanted to show you with this is that if you actually change surface, things would look quite different. So here, um, this is uh, Nadal versus Anderson as it would play out on grass. And Nadal is a little worse on grass, as we said, and Anderson is actually pretty good on grass. So here things would, would be a lot closer, and um, Anderson would, would have actually been in with a shot, according to the model. Also, you can see that the set scores would change quite a lot, so the match is, is closer, and also these, these probabilities are pretty high, so now tie breaks would be expected to be quite, um, quite likely. Um, and Nadal would still be the favorite to win in, in four sets now. Uh, just for fun, I thought I'd also put the matchup in on clay. And um, yeah, here, so Nadal is, is incredibly good on clay, and Anderson is not very good on clay. So um, here, it wouldn't look too good for Anderson. Uh, there's basically no chance for him at all, and um, Nadal would be overwhelmingly likely to win in three sets. But because Anderson's a good server, he would still be expected to actually win a few games, so it wouldn't be a total blowout, maybe. Yeah, so, so in summary, um, I introduced this new point-based model, which outperforms the previous work. Um, it takes into account the surface effects and the um, time variability and, and the tournament effects. So there are a few things I'd really like to do in the future. Um, one thing is that this is, you know, to get these full, this full Bayesian model, I have to fit it with, its, um, with STAN, so that's an HMC sampler, and it takes about 80 minutes to fit, which is pretty quick given that, you know, it's, um, it's about 40,000 matches and something like, you know, 400 players, and you have to estimate 15 periods as well, so there are a lot of parameters in this model, actually. But it's still, you know, quite slow, and it means that I can't go further than maybe about five years back in the past, and I can't make the periods very short. So um, I think um, some variational Bayes or some approximate Bayes, Bayesian methods could be very interesting here. Another thing um, I'd be interested in looking at would be um, using a different skill time evolution. So Glico2, for example, so we said Glico1, right, is this kind of normal random walk. Glico2 actually draws the jump variances from another distribution. So what that means is that you can have bigger jumps every now and then, or s smaller jumps. Um, and that might help with players who get injured, for example, because maybe this, um, this assumption here of like, you know, constant variance for each player isn't, isn't right in that case. They might drop more quickly. Um, or maybe you could even imagine some Gaussian process and then it could, could model some kind of nonlinear thing and also take correlations into account. So another thing this random walk doesn't do is it won't take into account kind of upward trends so, um, but you might expect that if someone is, is getting better, maybe they'll continue to get better, and um, those kinds of things. And uh, finally, another interesting thing could be to look at some other link function, not just the binomial link, because we saw that the slight under-dispersion effect, so um, maybe a compoisson or something, something like that could be interesting. So, uh, yeah, with that, thanks for your attention. <laughs> We have time for a few questions, if there are any. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think this is very interesting. Thank you. Um, one thing I'm struggling with, though, I, I didn't fully understand the challenge or the issue behind not being able to build in sort of a, a within match achieve based factor. Um, I mean, it just seems to me if you're, maybe I'm oversimplifying it. Yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting point. So um, actually, yeah, uh, Stephanie and I actually have done some prior work on that. So you can, you can try to come up with alternatives to the IID model, which kind of improve, you know, take, take some things into account. So for example, uh, one, one thing is players tend to underperform on breakpoints. Um, players play worse when they're down a set and better when they're up a set and these kinds of things. So you can totally build a kind of better IID model um, the nice thing about the ID model is that it's all analytic, so it's just very easy to calculate all these things. Um, you know, it's, it's basically closed form. Whereas with these, um, with the other models, so the way I've typically done it in the past is just to run a Monte Carlo simulation. So you might, you know, you run the Monte Carlo simulation, and then based on the current state, you update 
for probabilities and so on. So you know you can do those things. Um, the IID model is just sort of the kind of the simplest way of going about it, but but yeah, you, you could improve on it. Any other questions? Yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, the approach you're talking about, I guess one thing you can do is, uh, if we go back to, uh, where is it, so many slides, um, this one. If we go back to this plot, you see that these contours actually are pretty similar along this line here. So they get a little bit wider up here and, a little, and down here. Um, so yeah, so, so one, one thing you can do is you can basically take a slice through this at some point, which corresponds to like a constant sum, and then use ELO to find where on the slice you are, you know, which wind probability that gives you. Um, and that performs reasonably well. Uh, so the thing is, though, that there are some differences. So if you do that, you get a very good estimate of the difference but you don't get a very good estimate of the sum. So typically people fix it to say 1.2 or something like that. Um, and for, for the match win probabilities, that doesn't actually matter too much. But for, you know, if you want to calculate um, whether tie break is likely or 6-3 set scores, then that sum actually becomes quite important. So, um, so I guess the advantage of this approach is that um, you, I would expect that you can do better at predicting the exact set scores and things like that than if you just inverted ELO. Okay. Yes. Uh, on that slide where you plotted the players and the demos and the random random mm -hmm. corner, it looked like there was some very natural kind of clusters. Um, should you explore that and figure out what the common characteristics were? Uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Yeah, so I haven't actually done any formal clustering on that, but sort of by s staring at it, there's definitely things you can see. So. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just, you know, that like Isner obviously is an extreme case where he's just very good at serving and, and poor at returning. But these players here definitely, they share some characteristics. So they're all fairly tall, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very strong servers. Um, and um, yeah, so there's definitely, there's definitely these patterns you can kind of see, but I haven't done any formal clustering on it as yet. Karlovich, yeah, yeah Karlovich. Maybe I'll show you the 2015 version of this plot. So unfortunately, Karlovich has, um, has de declined uh, and didn't make the top 40 cut. But uh, it's a very good point. He is uh, actually even more extreme than Isner. So um, Isner looks like a great returner compared to Karlovich. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, maybe I should, ex should have explained that a bit more. Um, so, so the thing, the, the match win probability is basically driven by, by the difference in serve winning probabilities. And so, um, yeah, if you add together the, um, I think if you do the maths, like the, that sum, you know, that, that sum you're doing with a serve and return probability is basically what drives the difference. So that's why I chose to do that. But um, maybe if you want to predict kind of overall greatness, it does seem like the players who have strong serve skill and return skill, you know, that cluster up there, um, these guys here, they do seem to be the most successful. So maybe, uh, maybe it would be interesting to look at kind of success versus some other quantity like that. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting point. Any more? No. All right, thank you. <laughs>